Welcome to the Daily Dev Talk with me, Adrian Nanchev, where we explore and share experiences, stories and lessons seven days a week from across the games industry, helping you make the best game you can. Stay tuned for today's episode. Good morning, Overload Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Daily Dev Talk, talking to game developers from across the world to bring you experiences, stories and lessons seven days a week. Today, I'm joined with Delvin, Delvin Mason from HugeBot to talk about his latest game, Four Realms. Delvin, talk about yourself first, please, and how you got into the games industry. Sure. Uh, so my name is Delvin Mason. I am out in uh, Illinois in the United States. Uh, my latest game is Four Realms. Uh, I'm working under the studio name HugeBot. Um, I got started in video games uh, in college, maybe 13 years ago. Uh, you know, I didn't know at the time that, oh, you can do this as a living. Uh, and so about midway through college, I'm like, I'm going to try and make this work. Uh, so I have been working at it for about 13 years. It's hard, but if you love it, you're just going to keep doing it. So. Wow. So two big thoughts went from my head straight away then. One, when you said, if you love it, what reminded me then is Steve Jobs. He said, you've got to love what you're doing. An irrational person will quit and stop doing what they're doing. And two, when you said you been uh, you wanted to, you realize this at a young age, people do this for a living. I slowly realized that as well when I was a lot younger, like ten, thirteen, or so years ago. That hang on, people actually make games. Interesting idea. I could go into something like that in the future. Yeah. And you know, here I am, rocking rock, like a hurricane. So uh, tell me, uh, have you worked on have you worked on any other games before at all, or game jams or such? I'm sorry, one more time. Have you worked on any other games before? Oh, yes, yes. I've done lots of games. Like I said, for 13 years, I've done my own projects, and I've worked with some um, larger studios before. Um, you know, I did my own small projects in college. That's the best way to get started is to just start making mm. games for yourself, start learning how to do it. It really is an art form, and it takes a lot of time to get any skill. You know, I've been doing this for a while, and I'm only really starting now to feel like I've got a good grasp of what you can really do in games. Um, but, you know, I've done a number of projects. I've done uh, Mushroom Men on the Wii, Ghostbusters on the Wii. Uh, I did uh, Rock, Paper, Dropkick, which is one of my bigger Flash games. And then I worked on Starhawk for the PS3. And recently I've been working on Four Realms. Cool. A whole and host of other games that, you know, prototypes that didn't make it. So. <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty cool. A, a quite extensive portfolio then. So quite a lot of knowledge. So, um... Tell me about your studio then, Huge Bot. Uh, how many people? What's the structure? You know, how how does things happen over there? <laughs> it's a pretty small company because it's just me. It's a it's a really garage indie studio, uh, which is sometimes just what you got to do. It you know games are hard. You got to be a little crazy to keep pushing forward with it. And if you can find a team to work with, that's awesome. And sometimes you just got to work on what you want to work on. Uh, so yeah, it's just me right now. Mm, okay, that's pretty cool. So uh, let's talk about Four Realms. Tell us about the game and what you wanted the player to experience. <laughs> so uh, one of the things I've been struggling with lately is how to pitch this appropriately, so bear with mm. me, but it's, it's this. You're, uh, you're out to save the four animal nations in a right. platforming action RPG inspired by trading card games. Um, so when I started this project, you know, as a game developer, you pick up on things that you like about other games and things you always want to work on. Um, so one idea I've had for a while is a lot of people play Magic the Gathering or other trade, trading card games. Um, and, you, you know, you always play these creatures, but you always have the idea of wouldn't it be fun to summon and control these creatures? Wouldn't it be fun to have these spells do more than just numeric things? Um, so that's one idea that's core to Four Realms. And then another one is uh, there's an old game called King Arthur's World. Um, have you played it? No. It's an old uh, Super Nintendo game where you play King Arthur and you kind of summon troops. It's vaguely in the vague of, vaguely in the realm of uh, Lemmings, but it's fantasy-based yeah. and you can summon a variety of characters. Um, I was always a fan of the idea of the game. It's kind of got this Ant Hill gaming style. So Four Realms is kind of merging these two uh, gaming ideas, and I think when you come at it, you'll feel a lot like, say, like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings coming out, being a very powerful wizard, but not like almighty, so you can just instantly fix everything with a wave of your hand. Sounds like a very interesting and de detailed and deep game. Oh, uh, it's 
definitely very complex, which definitely makes it hard to, you know, um, get people's interest. Mm. But anyone who's looking for a challenge, I think they'll definitely like it. It's a very unique game. Anyone looking for a challenge? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so tell me, um, I'm curious, how did you go about promoting the game? What strategies worked well and what didn't work so well? Uh, I am definitely learning the marketing. I have done a lot in games, but this is my first really big foray into production and promotion. Uh, one thing to realize is you have to remember that, especially when you're doing outreach and promotion, everything is very specific to your project and what you're working on. And so while you can find a lot of information, not all of it will apply to you particularly accurately. Uh, one big thing, they always talk about building a crowd, uh, and oftentimes in marketing speak you hear, talk about the value that you're adding, and this can be kind of confusing oh, yeah. if you haven't been doing marketing, but if you're a game developer and you think about it, you kind of know it a little intuitively, the value you're adding is an awesome game, right? Uh, and so yeah. my suggestion for any new developers, um, especially if you're doing a game that's kind of a bigger indie desktop PC game, just put out demos and prototypes pretty early so people can start playing, um, and then you'll build some trust in your brand because they'll see what you're working towards. They can see what you're actually talking about, and then they'll start to you know they'll start to follow you there. Definitely, I agree. Some people have said that five to six months before the release date, you want to start building the momentum, start releasing pictures, trailers, demos, so on and so forth yep. to the, you to the wider that. world. Yeah, you want to do that to the wider as world. Soon as you can. Sorry. It's all right. Yeah. Um, do as much as you can. It's even more than five to six months, depending on the size of your project and your timeline. Um, for me, I've got mm. a broad timeline because I have to work with what the time I have. So, you know, just start almost as soon as you can, basically. Yes. Um, also, going back a tiny bit, you mentioned that value you're adding. This is, one, very paramount and important when it comes to any form of business to add the value. And the greater your service, in this case, entertainment, the greater the monetary return is. So the more you entertain people whether it's through abstract ways or educational ways, the greater the return, the greater the appreciation, the accommodation, the acclamation, and the monetary return. You also mentioned um, uh, that, uh, that value is awesome game. I, From talking to people from, from previous episodes, I had this, um, I created this, this uh, set them, this, um, this motto, if you won't play it, you won't pay for it. If you, as making the game, you won't play it, you as a consumer will not pay for it. Do you think that resonates? It definitely resonates. Um, you know, there's a lot of developers who they come in, they see like all these guys making big bucks. And so they kind of just try and come in and clone. But the fact mm. of the matter is, even in those industries, if you don't have some passion for what you're working on, it's going to show in your projects. So I think what you're saying definitely has a lot of accuracy there. Yeah, have passion. I I agree, especially, and um, oh, there's something else I was going to say, but it just slipped my mind. But that's all right. So, but uh, Delvin, I'm curious. How did you go about funding the game? What worked well, and what didn't work so well? <laughs> well, the game isn't really funded per se. Like a lot of indie game studios, I am using mostly my free time to do a lot of the work, and then any money I work, many, any money I earn from other jobs, you know, is going into that. So it's a mm -hmm. super tight budget. Uh, I'm on Kickstarter right now trying to get some more funds so I can get the business costs and the music costs paid for. Um, you know, you're looking for funds everywhere. Uh, it's tough. you got to work with what you got. And like I said, that's why I'm a solo studio at the moment. Very lean. Yeah, cool. Very lean. Yes. Uh, what's, the, what's the word? Um, oh, I forgot. I forget. It's in my mind. Um, you, not cheap, but uh, price, 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 price cutting. <laughs> That's it. That's what I was looking for. So speaking of cutting, actually, Delvin, I'm curious, what was cut from the game and why? What was cut from the game? Um, yeah. You're always, when you're working on a game, you have to worry about scope and what you can do. Uh, you know, I am on a slow burn right now building the game about halfway. This lets me be a little more flexible on my scope. Um, but I do mm -hmm. know, like, in the early start of the project, I wanted to have a much more dynamic uh, kind of political system. When you explore the realms, you could choose which faction you follow, and you have to kind of um, be careful what actions you choose so that you can kind of unite the realms on a more political basis. That's been simplified down a lot more. Um, you know, just even thinking about that, I think any developer hears that is like, you're crazy. 
Um, but when you start a project like this, you know, it's your dream project. You want to put in everything you've wanted to see in games. But I decided to focus more on the core mechanics of creating spells and creating clever solutions to your the puzzles you'll come across. Mm -hmm. I get you. So what was the biggest thing you learned while working on the game? <laughs> uh, games are always a challenge to work on. Um, and you always learn a lot of stuff. Uh, on this particular project, I've been doing the art myself, so I've been learning a lot about the art, and it has a long ways to go. Uh, you know, uh, I've always done a little art, and I think that showed some, but especially on the art side, you can show I haven't done as much animation, and it definitely feels sluggish. I know you are an animator, so <laughs> you could probably mm -hmm. give me some tips on that end, but that's been one thing I've been learning. Uh, I've also been learning a lot about the promotion and marketing. I know a lot of game developers you know, they don't feel comfortable with it. We come in with, as, with like an artist's eye. We want to make something cool, but we don't necessarily know how to talk about it. And that's something I'm fiddling with right now. You know, you just got to, you got to get feedback, see what works and keep on working. It's, you know, that's the way everything is. Get feedback, keep on working. Cool. Yeah, iteration. So what was the worst thing that happened and how did you overcome it? <laughs> For this project, uh, it, Right now, I'm going to admit I'm struggling a little bit on Greenlight and Kickstarter, just getting the word out and figuring out how to get the promotions going. Um, how am I dealing with it? You know, you just keep working. You look at what mistakes you've made, and you try and pick up from those mistakes, right? You try and learn from them. And that's kind of the answer to everything I know, but, um, you know, coming in, you know your weaknesses, you work on them, you try and improve, and you keep on going. Yeah, learn from the mistakes. But there's nothing stopping you from learning of the mistakes of other people. <laughs> and that's one reason why I started this. Yeah, it's, this is actually great. You know, um, I hope more people watch your blog, especially since you're focusing very much on video games. Um, you know, it's sometimes hard to find what worked and what didn't. You can look up postmortems and, you know, mm. you try and pick up as much as you can. I get you. That's, yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. So, uh, what was the best game dev purchase you made, whether it was a software, piece of equipment or hardware, or simply a, a good desk and a comfortable chair? <laughs> um, the best? I don't know. I tend to go with more open source programs, but when you're a game dev, mm. you always look at your engine first. Uh, I've been using Construct 2 right now, and I really enjoy it. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty... It's actually, for such a visual driven engine, it actually has a lot of flexibility and a lot of comparatives to more uh, complex programming languages. But um, I would say for every dev, your engine usually is what comes first because that's, you know, it's like your pencil, you know, it's what you work mm. with, so. Definitely. I remember, funnily enough, I remember 2013, I'm making an auto runner game. It would, uh, I was thinking what engine to use and I eventually settled on Construct 2. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, 2D, modeled in Blender, made it in Construct 2, published. It's online, it's on my portfolio, you can see it somewhere. It's called, called, uh, called Untra. Uh, I, I can't remember how well it works. I have to check but, um, it Yeah, so, yeah, I, I used Construct 2 before, and I also looked at some open source engines, but I find that they, they tend to lack the, the basic um, things you come to expect from a more established engine, and that if you want to add more stuff to it, you've got to have some fundamental programming skills to edit the uh, source code for open source ones definitely um and when you're coming in open source i think a lot of times especially if you're more programming based you'll be picking more an api versus an engine mm. it's all again you should kind of focus on what your uh project is so um construct 2 hits two prime things for me um at the time unity didn't have a 2d engine but construct 2 is 2d focused um, i've done mm. games i didn't want to spend too much time creating, you know, level editors and that kind of stuff. I wanted to get right to the 2D. Also, Construct 2 is very affordable. Um, I know Unity is very popular, but it's also a little pricier. It's also 3D focused, although I haven't tried out the 2D section. Yes, uh, I'm not very good with scripting. Uh, I've tried Unreal Script. I understand the basics, inheritance, OO, ints, loops, variables, void, so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, the, the book stops with, with coding. I don't, I don't do it. Um, so it's visual scripting, so I'm not too fond of Unity. I, here it's quite good, quite quite sound. And with all, the, all the plugins, you can create some stuff really easy and really quick. But no, it doesn't seem to me as easy to work with as, say, Construct 2 or Unreal Engine 4. 
Well, if you're doing Construct 2, you are making a good step towards getting that more uh, programming style, and mm, you, should, yeah. you could make that step to Unity, because you'll get a little feel, you'll see like, oh, this is loops, and you'll start to feel out, oh, this works like this, because there's a lot of similarities there. And then eventually, depending if the project fits, obviously, um, you know, the reason Unity is so popular is it is A, a game engine, and B, very flexible, and that scripting language is very flexible. So. Yeah, I remember... They, well, the visual scripting is a heck of a lot easier than general coding. And I remember also using a Warcraft 3 map editor back in like 2007 to make uh, basic games for that, for you know, for that modding community. Uh-huh. And that was like the ultra basics of code and ultra basics of visual scripting. But back then it's like in sentences. It's like if such if such and such happened, such and such will occur. <laughs> but now it's a bit more a bit more advanced with even the visual scripting. Yeah. So I'm curious then, what was uh what was? Do you have any uh, game developer related book, le- lecture, or learning resource worth sharing? Uh, you know, I have plenty. It kind of depends on what you want to learn. Um, so I come more from the design end of things, specifically game design. When you're learning game design, I recommend picking up a uh, a good book on just interaction design because that's your foundation before you even get to the game design. Um, I have one even here on my desk, the Essentials of Interaction Design. Um, because that's the core of design, is thinking about people and usability before you even get to the game part of it, right? Because it's easy mm. to have an idea, but a lot of people struggle in game design making it usable. Even I struggle a bit to this day, you know? So um, that's a good starting point. Um, but there's lots of good books out there, Rules of Play, uh, such a series of lenses, can't remember the name. Um, so, I, you know, you focus on what you're doing in the game, um, and there's a lot of aspects to games. There's books on art, so. You mentioned uh, lenses then and, and rules of play. Am I right in thinking that's the book that comes with like these cards or something that you can really mix up and generate new ideas? Uh, possibly. Because that book then came to mind then as you mentioned that is all. And I couldn't remember what it was called. I know rules of play doesn't. That's the one I actually have. Uh, mm-hmm. That other one might have. I, it's been a while since I've looked at it. That's all right. So, like an Evernote or Trello, do you have a useful or productivity-enhancing software, app, extension, or website you can recommend? <laughs> Not really. I'm pretty old school. I use your standard spreadsheet, and then I've got my handy sketchbook that I take notes oh. on. So. <laughs> cool. Cool. Exactly. Um, do you code at all using Notepad? Using Notepad? Forget Notepad++. Notepad itself. Notepad itself? Yes. No, I use some Notepad plus plus. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, what advice can you give to aspiring game developers, small indie studios, and people trying to get to where you are today? Uh, you just got to keep working at it. It it is hard. It gets harder because you want to do more, and it just keeps getting harder, and yet at the same time, you see the stuff you're turning out is like, this is what I've always wanted to do. Um, so if you're coming into it, don't think about the money, because I will tell you right now, it's not a very not a very lucrative prospect, but if you really like games, just keep working. You'll start making the games you want to make. It just takes time. I mean, a lot of people talk about the 10,000 steps, you know, the 10 years, it does take a lot of time, especially for games. It's such a complex genre or medium, I should say. Yeah, I definitely agree, and I think the best way to make games is to make games. Exactly. If you're like a blogger or a singer or a writer, you blog, you sing, and you write. If you make games, you make games. And uh, ten thousand steps. I heard there's an idea of ten thousand hours as well. Oh, maybe it's ten thousand hours. Heard? Maybe I misquoted it. I can't That's all right. Exactly. And I, I calculated it. It's about about fourteen months, roughly. Something like that, 10,000 hours. <laughs> yeah, if you but, you know, straight, yeah, that'd be kind of crazy. <laughs> but to, yeah, to be honest, you probably have to spread that out over, let's say, five to plus years, because no way you can work straight for 14 hours, 14 months. Yeah. You, you can do a good good amount, but you know, 24 hours, it's not possible. It just came to mind. So uh, what is next for you, and what's the best way that the audience can contact you? Go to hugebot.com. Um, you'll find links to everything there. <clears throat> um, next for me, I'm finishing up my Kickstarter, so please check it out. Let me know what you think. There is a demo available. Uh, I'm going to finish that out and figure out where to go next with Four Realms. I've also I've got some great feedback so far, so just keep on working.
When does your Kickstarter finish? Uh, finishes August 13th. Mm-hmm. Okay, August 13th. How cool is that? Well, uh, Delvin, it appears that we're out of time for this episode of the Daily Dev Talk. Great talking to you and a few things that are worthwhile considering, I, I think, when it comes to um, making games in the future. Learn from, learning from your mistakes and using engine that's suitable for you and your game. All right. Thank you, Adrian. Cool. Wish you well in your future endeavors. And uh, Overload Nation, stay tuned. More episodes to come. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Daily Dev Talk with me, Adrian Nanchev. If you are a game developer that wants to get your name and game out there and to share your experiences and stories, or you have feedback or opinions of the show, then contact me at info at gameoverload.co.uk. That's info at gameoverload.co.uk. Stay tuned for tomorrow's episode. More to come.